think it can be on the hook and will still stay on, but I don't want to take the chance. Well, uh, I'm, my name is Doug Sobey. I am, uh, I've been involved with the museum for 10 years, and I know quite a few of you already, so hardly needs. But I, there's the odd person I don't know. So uh, um, my background is um, uh, university teaching in the UK uh, in the field of ecology and environmental biology. And my research interests have been, in the last 30 years, the history of the forests of Prince Edward Island. So this has nothing to do with my, <laughs> my uh, academic or um, research interests at all. But it has to do with this area and the museum, which is also another interest of myself. And um, so I think, uh, it will, I hope it will be informative to you tonight, because this man has largely been forgotten. Can you say over the podium, Julie? Yeah, don't worry. Yeah. Um, uh, the uh, man has been forgotten, largely. Although in his day, he was extremely well known. And uh, the fact that he's forgotten is uh, a mark against our ignorance rather than his status. And uh, he is one of Prince Edward Island's most famous uh, native sons. Um, and in his day, he was recognized as such on the island. Um, and his day, uh, his day, perhaps I better be showing you um, I'm going to put in the, um, the mouse. It doesn't seem to change on the... Uh... Oh, well, we've got him already. <laughs> he popped up when I, my back was turned there, so... Um, um, Jacob Gould Skirman. Uh, those are pictures of him at various stages in his life. Uh, he was born in 1842, and he died... 54 rather and he died in 18, or 1942. Uh, this is a summary of, just at the start, so that you have some idea of uh, the nature of his achievement. Uh, and those, by the way, are all listed in the poster program, which I'll discuss in a moment in the, in the museum. Um, he was exceedingly uh, did exceedingly well in academic competitions. The Gilchrist Examination Scholarship uh, for All Canada, uh, he won that uh, for study in the United Kingdom. And then when in the United Kingdom he won a traveling fellowship in competition with all UK uh, students, including Oxford and Cambridge, for study in European universities. And was one of the two people getting that and achieved a master's uh, at, at um, London, University of London, a doctor's, uh, doctoral degree at Edinburgh, and then what he's best known for, having passed his educational um, run, he became the, he taught, and he taught at various colleges, which I'll mention, but he's best known for being the president of Cornell University in New York State for 28 years, Cornell's second president. And even while president of the university, he was chosen uh, or asked by the President McKinley of the United States to uh, be preside over the first Philippine Commission. I'll mention that later. He published 10 books. And then after retirement from university, he was American ambassador to uh, China in the 1920s for five years and Germany. And they were top um, ambassadorial posts and um, given many honorary degrees and was involved in 
uh, politics on the side, uh, New York Constitutional Convention, and so on. So, just some, uh, just to give you some background there. The reason, or the start of this um, interest in um, in uh, Jacob Gould Skirman stems from uh, two people who I acknowledge here: uh, David Pope who is a Summerside native, uh, son of uh, Peter Pope, uh, the late Peter Pope, uh, but he lives in Salt Lake City and has for a very long time, uh, had a very keen interest in Jacob Gould Skirman, and he tried to interest me in him some years ago, perhaps five or six years ago, and um, also Paul Skirman, who uh, in association with David, um, has um, developed an interest in uh, uh, Jacob uh, Skierman, as he was called. He didn't use Gould until he was older. Uh, Paul is um, a member, was a member of our board for the last two years, and uh, he also, at the 2016 uh, Loyalist event, spoke on uh, David, when the United Empire Loyalists of Canada were meeting here in 2016, Paul gave a short talk on uh, um, Jacob Gould's German. And as a result, um, and, and also Paul supplied me with materials that David had collected, uh, original photographs and uh, documents and also references. And so that uh, sort of developed my interest, and I wasn't really very interested in someone, uh, sort of, uh, who has left Prince Edward Island and achieved their fame elsewhere, in that you think, well, they're outside of island history, uh, they're not really part of the island story anymore. But what I found in reading the story of Jacob uh, Gould Skirman is that he, he never forgot his roots, and he he wrote about them, his background in Freetown and Summerside and Prince of Wales, uh, and long after he left, and when he was at the height of his achievement. So he never forgot his island connections, and uh, he always paid tribute to the education that he got on the island. Um, as a result of this, uh, in 2020, we created I uh, started off one of the students in the uh, museum, um, and the student, his name is covered, was Nathan Wright. It was Nathan Wright who started the poster, and then I sort of finished and added to it. And last summer, we put this up in the museum without any uh, additions to it, just the poster, and last year was a COVID summer, so uh, there wasn't much attention that we could give to it other than put it up. But this year, we've uh, added considerably to it uh, in terms of our small museum. We've added quite a bit to it. We've got uh, a case, a display case, with objects connected with uh, Skirman. Uh, some of them original uh, uh, books that he has signed. Uh, others are just um, books that were written about him. And uh, so, have a look at the exhibit. Uh, on your way out or on another occasion. Um, next year we may elaborate it a bit more uh, and uh, improve parts of it. But it uh, covers largely what I'm talking about tonight is in the poster that, that is in the, the museum. And this is part of the series. We've had tried to connect the talks with the exhibitions that we've opened this year. and. Um, I ended up with having to do Jacob Gould Skirman because I'm the only one who seems to uh, be able to. I asked David Pope, but he couldn't get here this this summer. I think we start where where I first met Mr. Skirman, Jacob Gould Skirman, is where perhaps some of you have met him. It's the monument in uh, Freetown. You probably whiz by it uh, and don't stop very often, but if you stop and look at the monument. It's, uh, it was erected in uh, 1951 uh, by the um, Historic Sites and Monuments Board of Canada, who, who recognizes great Canadians by building 
plinths of these sort, sorts near their place, usually near their place of birth. And you can see, um, and in a very brief uh, description, they're limited to something like 365 characters. They've tried to summarize the life of this important man. Uh, born at Freetown, educated at Prince of Wales, Acadia, several European universities. Skirman was professor of English and philosophy at Acadia and Dalhousie before moving to Cornell in 1886. So he's only 32 when he went to Cornell. The author of several scholarly works, Skirman also was also able, an able administrator serving as president of Cornell for uh, 29 years there, chairman of the Philippine Commission in 1899, joint author of, the, uh, of its report, and in 1912 he began a diplomatic career while still at um, Cornell, and then on his retirement he went, uh, he continued as a diplomatic uh, appointment uh, of the American government to China and Germany. Um, the the monument um, thus tries to summarize his life. Uh, he was, I'm just going to show, to start off with by showing pictures that David Pope has collected. These are original press photographs that are collectible. Uh, they're the original photograph. And uh, uh, it indicates the importance of the man that the press was following him. On the reverse of each of these photographs, you can see marks indicating what the press uh, wants you to, uh, in this case, what wants to, uh, in sending this out on the, uh, to, the, to the press around the USA, they would say, Honorable Jacob Gould, Skirman on board the American Oriental mail liner, President Jackson, that's the name of the ship, on his arrival from China, and so on. So the American press were following him. That's him with his family in 1925, uh, en route between China and Germany. That is him and his wife of uh, long standing, um, um, married over 50 years. And uh, he's on his way to um, Germany. Um, on, this is the same trip, probably. And then two pictures of him uh, dressed, uh, they've been altered by the press, those markings are original markings, uh, and uh, the first one is, uh, which you can't read, but it says he's, been, he's called at the White House to confer with President Coolidge uh, uh, about the ambassadorship, and the other one um, is that he's sailing for Berlin uh, with his wife and daughter on the SS George Washington on June the 10th. Um, then he's in Germany and posing for a picture, uh, uh, saying that this is the first call, perhaps it is, uh, telephone connection between Germany and the United States in 1928. This is dur during the Weimar Republic, it's before Hitler began his rise in Germany, but uh, it was an important five years in the history of Germany. He retired from the uh, 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 diplomatic service and uh, then went back to academia in part, and uh, here he is at the Associates Dinner uh, of the California Institute of Technology in 1932, and you'll probably recognize the man sitting beside him. Does everyone know who it is? Yeah. It's Albert Einstein, who uh, I'll be using some, or quoting some of his uh, uh, praise of Skirman later on. He got to Skirman, um, by the way, in the United States, his name changed to Sherman, a uh, Sherman, I guess. Uh, it just automatically happened in that many of the Skirmans of the USA had already shifted their pronunciation. Uh, but we know that Skirman was the original Dutch pronunciation and was brought to Canada, but he shifted his, uh, uh, they, he began to know, be known as Jacob Gould Sh Sherman, <laughs> and uh, he he was um, involved in um, politics, but never directly. He never ran for office, uh, but he was very much um, uh, um, a supporter of the Republican Party of the day, 
and I must say it's a different party that we're talking about from the Republican Party of today. It was the party of McKinley and Roosevelt, um, and of course Lincoln before that, and was actually in some respects more liberal or left-wing than the Democrats uh, uh, on, for example, women's emancipation. Uh, so we're not talking, <laughs> I have to say, because <laughs> uh, nowadays, I, in Canada, to be a supporter of the Republican Party implies um, a, a slur against a person. But Americans who are supporters, please excuse me, and I see there are Americans in the audience, but that's the Canadian view. You're not offending us. Pardon? You're not offending us. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, he did go back occasionally to academia. Here he is with it's a photograph, 1937. The date is smudged on the back. I think it's October. Um, three living presidents of Cornell. Uh, he goes back to 1892, and then his successor uh, on the extreme um, right of the photograph, and the, the, the new person being installed in 1937 is uh, Dr. Day there. So um, he uh, still kept up a connection with Cornell. And here he's speaking uh, to the uh, New York State Constitutional Convention, May 31st, uh, uh, to mark the 150th anniversary of New York's ratification of the federal constitution. Um, as you can see, politics in those days was almost a totally male affair. Uh, but there is one woman here in this no third term for any president, which was... Uh, 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 a Republican campaign against uh, uh, Roosevelt taking a third term, which he, he ultimately did. So the campaign didn't succeed. And uh, so he was, you know, he's speaking. He's one of the chief speakers in the, um, uh, these events. Uh, well, I want to really talk about his early life, so that, we, you know, we can see his, um, his achievements later on. Uh, the, the early years uh, on Prince Edward Island is what I want, on his youth and education from 1854 to 1880, when he finally started uh, uh, his first job. And he became very quickly, uh, once he became the, the president of Cornell, he began to be used as an exemplum, as a model for American youth, of the poor boy who had achieved a high level of education through his own means. And the earliest that I've come across, or that David has found, is President Skirman of Cornell, New York Times, 2nd of October, 1898. And this is the, the line of the story that uh, these um, uh, will follow. And it says, Doing chores on a farm and selling but butter, nails, and calico in a country store were the boyhood occupations of the pres president of Cornell. And then it goes on to say he was born in Freetown, Prince Edward Island, 1854, and so on. Uh, and we'll look at this story later. Uh, this one, this says, and I'm just highlighting that because it says, he attended Summerside Grammar School Prince Edward Island for a year, and in the fall of 1870 goes on to Prince of Wales College. And um, this is what it says in the poster that we've created, but we've just discovered new information that this appears not to be correct, uh, because uh, it's been superseded by another uh, article, which is a direct quote from Skewerman, and he says he went to another school, and we'll hear that later. This is... Um, just uh, a couple of months later, 1899, and it's in the Daily Examiner in Charlottetown. And uh, it's been picked up from several papers, the Charlottetown Daily Examiner, it says it's from the Patriot, which probably is the Charlottetown Patriot, and in turn, somewhere slightly down uh, in the um, article, it says it's from the Herald, Montreal Herald, I think. So papers copying articles. And the significance of it that the, uh, he has stopped on his way at Montreal on his way from, um, he's going from, uh, en route to Manila in 1899 to chair the Philippine Commission. And so they picked up this story and they printed a long 
story, which is ver uh, in the first person. It's him telling the story of his youth. And obviously, it's uh, been written before. He's not been interviewed. Uh, it's a prepared story, and it's very informative of his past and his background and his attitudes. Uh, it was, uh, so that was 1899, and then there's a book published uh, in 1905, uh, sort of a book for boys, or um, um, does it say for boys? Usually it's assumed it's for boys. It's Little Visits with Great Americans or Success Ideals and How to Attain Them. And Skirman is included in this book. There are large numbers of short biographies of people. And uh, it's published by The Success Company. And it's uh, uh, promoting the story of, and this is the direct opening paragraph of it. The heading is, A Backwoods Boy Works His Way Through College and Becomes University President. And uh, at 10 years of age, he was a country lad on a backwoods farm on Prince Edward Island. At 13, he had become a clerk in a country store at a salary of $30 a year. At 18, he was a college student, supporting himself by working in the evenings as a bookkeeper. At 20, he won a scholarship in the University of London in to, to the University of London, or in the university, I guess, in competition with all other Canadian students. At uh, 25, he was professor of philosophy at Acadia College. Nova Scotia, now Acadia University. At 38, he was appointed president of Cornell University. At 44, he was chairman of President McKinley's Special Commission to the Philippines. In this summary is epitomized the career of Jacob Gould Skirman. It is a romance of real life such as is not unfamiliar in America. Mr. Skirman's career differs from that of some other self-made men, however, Instead of heaping up millions upon millions, he has applied his talents to winning the intellectual prizes of life and has made his way unaided to the front ranks of the leaders in thought and learning in this country. So he's not one of your money-grubbing big barons, railway barons, who also achieved good and, and went for the money. His career is a source of inspiration to all poor boys who have their own way to make in the world for he has won his present honors by his own unaided efforts. So, Skirman uh, partly uh, developed this, it's not a myth, I think it's the truth, as we shall see, it's not a sort of false story at all, but he himself promoted it uh, in his, uh, once he became president of Cornell. Uh, this is the earliest picture we have of him. Uh, at age 14, uh, 1868, uh, and that is his descent in the, the male line. Uh, his father was Robert Skirman, and his uh, great-grandfather, William Skirman, of course, the loyalist, and uh, his grandfather was Caleb. Uh, Caleb lived uh, just up here on the highway, uh, where... Uh, 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 I haven't got a picture of the house, but it's just, the house is still there, and uh, it's a house he would have known. Yeah, well, Lee Skirman used to live in his call. His yes, uh, Lee Skirman's house, if any of you know, but it's the first house <coughs> when you get onto the highway, the yellow house, it's sort of been redone over, but you can tell it's an old house. That's where his grandfather lived, and where his father was born, and uh, undoubtedly he would have visited it many times as a boy. His grandfather, you see, Caleb, uh, died when uh, he was just one year old, so he wouldn't have known his grandfather, and uh, certainly not, uh, but he would have been told stories of his great-grandfather and the loyalist background, I'm sure. Uh, because on Prince Edward Island, we all want to make connections, you know, he has many other connections, I don't know if you can see that very well. Uh, these, uh, this is the family of Robert Skirman and Lydia Goldrup. Uh, it, there should be a U, uh, G O U L D, in that. That's my mistake. Uh, and he had uh, five brothers and two sisters. And uh, some of those, um, I'm going to get my pointer. Uh, it, it, this family did quite well for themselves locally. 
in that uh, one of his brothers was Maynard Skierman, who founded the M.F. Skierman Company, uh, which is now Kent in Summerside, but it was a well-known um, business uh, under that name, M.F. Skierman, uh, with his brother, Major Skierman, and, and the other boys, Jacob uh, uh, and George, left for the United States, and all, 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 most of these got, got a fairly good education at home, uh, all of them. Davis, the eldest, uh, inherited the farm, and Davis's family still owns the farm. Uh, I, this, the source for this information is uh, Ross Graves' book, which was published in 75. So anyone where I'm missing dates, I know Robert has died, but I don't know what date. Uh, Robert uh, is succeeded by his sons. They, have, they still have the farm in uh, um, Freetown that uh, descends from, it's not exactly the same land as uh, um, Robert, uh, the uh, father, the, this uh, was occupying, but it's still in Skirman, there's still a Skirman farm, Skirman family. Uh, on his father's uh, side, I've already, Caleb uh, Lefergy, his, Robert, uh, his grandmother was Mary Lefergy, loyalist name, and Elizabeth Hyatt, his great-grandmother, was a uh, Huguenot name uh, from the um, New York area. On his mother's side, uh, Lydia Goldrop, he descends from Henry Goldrop and the Goldrops of Tryon, who were uh, settlers brought in by Samuel Holland in 1770, uh, uh, very early, 1770, uh, 1770, or even slightly earlier, 1768. And uh, Henry Goldrop died in 1768. He drowned at Tryon. He, before he could even get off the ship uh, on land, he drowned as uh, he was coming ashore. He was coming from Quebec. He was a soldier. And uh, uh, his son, an infant, uh, as you can see, was three years old, then um, survived and uh, had left a lineage which leads to um, uh, Jacob Gould. Uh, now, I just want to, I'm going to read directly from this article, that's the article in the, the Daily Examiner, to give you a flavor of the man. And this is that, uh, so these are the words of Jacob Gould Skurman in a sort of biographical uh, story of his childhood. And he, 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 and I don't have these words on the screen, so you're going to have to uh, bear with me reading them. I know, uh, he says, what it is to grow up in a new country, to feel the pinch of poverty and the heavy burden of toil that always accompanies such a life, to struggle hard for advantages which, can, which come quite in the natural course of events in more settled communities. By this I do not mean to say that my father was worse off than the general run of settlers in Prince Edward Island in the year 1854 when I was born. He had gone into the island a generation before, and had hewed a home out of the forest. And where he had gone was uh, in what is now Freetown, or was to become Freetown, and uh, his farm, his, his father, Robert's father Caleb, who was the son of William uh, the Loyalist, and this was generally happening with uh, the third generation Loyalists were moving inland. Robert's father, Caleb, had bought 171 acres of forest land in, in Freetown, in that area. Now, Freetown circled there, that's the corner, you know, the birches or wherever uh, the church is and the graveyard in Freetown. And so the uh, Skirman property that Caleb bought in 1839 is on the upper Freetown road or back road. And uh, it took a road to go through before you could start laying off farms. And the Freetown Road was, was laid off in 1827, the Upper Freetown Road after that. And so land, and of course, Freetown got its name because there was freehold land available for sale. And last, last week, uh, Don described uh, the early settlement history of Freetown. And uh, so the loyalists on the, the front, the waterfront area was used up, were buying 
for their uh, sons, their children, well, sons entirely, daughters would marry, uh, and uh, were buying forested land, inland, in various directions. It was happening in Middleton and in uh, uh, Shelton. They were moving away from uh, the Bedeck River, um, or the Dunk River, as it was, had become known. And Caleb bought that land in 1839, and he bought more than that. He settled two sons out there, uh, as two sons, William Cale uh, was his other son, and Robert. And in 1839, he bought the land. It's probable that Robert began clearing the forest then, but it wasn't transferred to his ownership until 1845. Now, that's nine years before um, Jacob Gould Spearman is born. So, to go back to his words, he says, At that time of my boyhood, that would be about 1860, he was born in 1854, my father had upwards of a hundred acres cleared and under cultivation. And uh, this, by the way, is the house in which he grew up in, which survived into the 1990s. It had been moved off the uh, site of the original house and into the Freetown village. And I used to see it as I was going down the Freetown Road, and I thought, that's a very old house. And then one year, one summer, I came back in the 1990s and it was gone. And I, I had no idea it was, it was the house that Jacob Gould Skierman had been born in. Uh, but uh, I worked that out from um, the Freetown book, Past and Present, and the ownership uh, which describes uh, properties and such. The, the property where he was born, if Seymour de Roche was here tonight, he, he, his father lived on the... Uh, not in that house, but on the, in the replacement house. Uh, um, it used to, before that, belonged to Simmons and McFarland. Or if, I don't know if they... If, uh, anyway, uh, uh, the, um, that's the house, moved off its original site, um, and now gone. That's the uh, property there in 1880, Meacham's Atlas, showing the... Uh, uh, John Davis, that's Davis, uh, Jacob Gould's brother, uh, it's, uh, and the monument uh, in Freetown is here, and that's the road that takes you to Kelvin Grove there. So it's right at the corner. And the school in Freetown is, uh, is right here, so the children had to go to school perhaps about a mile or so. Uh, he says that the, the time of uh, my uh, boyhood, uh, my father had upwards of 100 acres cleared and under cultivation. And uh, these figures, which I've compiled from uh, Freetown past and present, are from the census of, uh, if you look at just the green uh, columns, they represent, they're from the census of 1861 for um, uh, uh, the year 1860, the data applies to. And the bars that I've just put on are the actual figures for... Um, uh, Robert Skierman. So this is what his father had actually, in 1860, he says uh, he had cleared 100 acres, which, uh, so it's this black, uh, 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 these black bars are what actually his father had cleared. Robert Skierman uh, had 124.5 acres, 100 of that was in arable, so most of it is already cleared. He had uh, the average, these uh, figures are the average, but he's there, he's doing quite well uh, in that he has, uh, uh, in oats, he's got uh, 900. I filled in that 900, whereas the average is about 600. Oats was a cash crop which was sold as food for horses and shipped off the island. Potatoes, he got 700 uh, bushels of potatoes compared to the average of 200. He's got 80 of buckwheat, 4 tons of hay, and 100 of wheat. So he's doing quite well for himself. Uh, Robert, uh, the father of Jacob, in 1860, when uh, Jacob is, he, he, he's a better than average farmer, and in terms of animals, he's got three horses, 13 head of cattle, and 33 sheep, which are all above the average, and four uh, hogs. So, uh, but, uh, that w would have been perhaps prosperity, but you've got uh, eight children, to feed, and six sons to provide for uh, a future for as well. And he says, Jacob Gould says, 
But no amount of land and no amount of toil could give one much more than the bare necessities in that time and place. There was not a railway on the island, nor a daily newspaper. This is 1860, a daily newspaper. And as for theatres, I was never inside one until I was 20. The only books in my father's house were, three guesses, the Bible, another guess, Fox's Book of Martyrs, does that mean anything to you? It's uh, an Elizabethan, very staunchly uh, Protestant book of Mar the Protestant martyrs, but it was typical reading fair for uh, uh, Protestant Baptists, anyway. And the next one was Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. So, do any of you have any of those books? In well, I won't ask about the Bible, but you may have uh, Bunyan's, uh, and a few others, he says, of that standard class. My earliest books were all outdoors. And I think that was not a bad textbook for a youngster either, either, meaning he got his education largely not from those books so much. When, when I was 10 years old, and this would be 1864, I was hired for a day by one of our neighbors to help him with his threshing. The work assigned to me was to cut the bands of the oak sheaves and pass them to the man who fed the grain into the drum of the separator. It was not easy work. The sheaves went through the machine as fast as the man could handle them, and the boy who cut the bands had to make his hands fly. I worked at that from sunrise to dark, and at the end proudly carried home my pay. Six pence. As the money of the dominion stood then, it was equal to about ten cents. A cent an hour for the hardest kind of manual labor a boy could perform. That was the way money came in Prince Edward Island in those days. But it was big money to me, for it was the first I had ever seen that I could really call my own. <coughs> he also recorded in another uh, story, uh, and this is uh, reported, being small of stature, he was required to climb into large wool sacks and pack down the wool with his feet as it was thrown down from above. It was inside the stifling wool sack that he decided to become educated. <laughs> so. Uh, he didn't care for hard labor, but uh, it was really hard labor we're talking about, and un unpleasant uh, labor in a wool sack. Uh, the Freetown School, he wrote later of it, whatever may have been its deficiencies, the work of the teacher was thorough. The teacher was an old-fashioned drill master, and whatever he drove into our heads, he put there to stay. I went to this school summer and winter until I was 13, and by that time I had learned to read and write and spell and figure with considerable accuracy. Uh, when I was 13, then, I left home. This would be about 1867. I had formed the idea that I wanted to get into a store. I don't know that I had any clear idea about my future. I merely wanted to get into the town and do something for myself. So my father got me a place in the nearest town, Summerside a village of about a thousand inhabitants. The terms were that I was to board with my employer, as was the custom then, and in addition receive for my services $30 at the end of the year. Not a lordly sum, was it, for 12 or 14 hours work per day, but it was the first rung on the ladder for me. From that day until this, I have always been dependent on my own efforts. I worked in this store for a year, and then I got a place in a larger store in the same town with exactly twice the salary, $60 per year. That was advancement indeed, and I think it was Sinclair and Stewart. Uh, I haven't come across that, but I think Paul uh, uh, Skierman has found the name of the store. I remained there for two years until I was nearly 16, so sometime in 1870. Then I gave up the position of my own accord because I had determined to get a better education. I can remember well when I told my employer of my decision. I pondered it long, but I hated to tell him. I liked him and liked, I liked the business. I put the job off for a long time, but at last, one night, when we were walking home to supper together, I blurted out what was on my mind. He was greatly surprised. He told me that he liked me, he was satisfied with my work, and would like to keep me with him. 
Then and there, he offered to double my pay for the next year if I would stay with him. I thanked him, but said I wanted to get an education. That was the turning point for me. On the one side was my desire for an education. I did not know how to obtain it, except that it must be by my own efforts. On the other side was the certainty of $120 yearly, in addition to my board, and the prospect of still further advancement as soon as I was ready for it. My three years as a clerk gave me a training that was to prove invaluable in later years, when I became president of Cornell University. I learned business methods, and I learned to deal with men. In all sincerity, I can say that I consider this early work in a country store no less valuable than my scholastic experience in fitting me for my present vocation. When I left my clerkship, I had something over $80 saved for my wages and a plan for my immediate educational future. I'm going to come back to that one. Yeah. I went to the school in Princetown where the languages and higher mathematics were taught, as well as the rudiments, and began my preparations for college. I took up Greek, Latin, algebra, and geometry all in the same week, if not on the same day. I learned them all from one teacher. Now this is in his own words. You know, the other said he went to the school in Summerside Grammar School. This says, I went to the school in Princetown, and I think someone's made the assumption that uh, the school is called Princetown and is in Summerside where he was living. So I think it's beyond doubt that he didn't go to Summerside Grammar School, but, uh, which is the Summerside School that still exists, the elementary, but uh, to Princetown, which is this building, which is uh, uh, in a different location from which it used to be. And I don't know if it had two stories. Yes. Yes. There was yes. a Princetown in um, Malbec. That's it. Yeah, this is it. That's yeah. it. Yeah. That's it. It's the Fanning School, as it's uh, called. Yeah. Fanning School. So this is uh, two years ago, or was it the year, or last summer, I had a person come from the, they're, they're restoring again the Fanning School, at least they're revitalizing it, and they wanted to know if Jacob Gould Skirman had gone to Princetown School or Fanning School, and I said, oh no, definitely, it says, you know, it says he went to Somerset Grammar, and it was this winter that Earl came across this, or found this uh, story in the uh, examiner, which says he went to, Princetown School uh, instead of Summerside. So you can't always rely on primary sources, but this you can't get pr more primary than this. He's quoting it himself, saying, I went to Princetown. I went, uh, um, the, um, I'll go back to the um, um, previous slide. Jacob's father, Robert, died at middle age. Uh, leaving eight children, the youngest only seven. Jacob himself was uh, about 21. Robert's wife, Lydia Goldrup, from all accounts, uh, and this quote comes from the Skirman book, uh, it's a biography of M.F. Skirman. From all accounts, a woman of marked ability encouraged the children to make something of themselves. A granddaughter recalled that she ran a tight ship. There was a blackboard for correcting the children's English, and the older ones were expected to teach their younger siblings. If any punishment was given at school, the same was given again at home. Despite this discipline, it was a high-spirited family full of tricks and fun. They had a fondness for practical jokes. Once the boys got under the hard man's bed in the loft, raising the mattress and scaring him terribly. <laughs> so uh, this is a story that's passed down. The unusual thing I... Uh, there is no picture of uh, Lydia Goldrum. She died in 1913. It's uh, odd that, uh, uh, you know, in the Skirman book, uh, which indicates that probably Ross Graves couldn't find a photograph, I've uh, called um, uh, <coughs> uh, Mrs. Skirman, who has passed away in the last year or two, and she said they didn't have any in Freetown in the house that had come down in the family, and I've called the Maynard Skirman family and asked jo Joey Skirman, had they any photograph of her? So it's odd, you know, 1913 people were taking photographs of their uh, uh, family and the importance of the mother who had to raise all these children on her own uh, 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 after the death of her husband. 
So whether there's any in the, uh, um, in the Cornell um, archives, I don't know. Uh, Jacob Gould then, I'll just go back a bit, uh, and uh, just, uh, he then went to Princeton, and uh, he, I had but one year in which to get my preparation for college. My money would not last longer than that time. And in order to go on, I must win one of the two scholarships in Prince of Wales College offered in each county of the island. I don't believe I ever worked as hard before or since as I did in those months. The result was that I began to have a bad pain in the back of my head. I told a physician whom I knew about it, whom I knew about it. And he said, if you want to keep on your studies, this is what you must do. At the end of the term, shut up your books. Don't look at the book, a book all summer, but go out and work on your father's farm. I took his advice. For three months, I didn't open a book. This was the summer of 1870. But went home and did all kinds of farm work. I bound wheat behind the reaper and kept my end up with the rest of the other workmen. For me, it was the best thing I could ever have done. And he goes on to say that he, throughout life, then practiced that. He spent two hours a day uh, away from his work and studies, outdoors, walking and uh, skating and so forth. The, the college scholarship examinations were held in September. This would be 1870. I was afraid that I had not much chance of winning, but I stood first of all the candidates on the island. I have been fortunate... Uh, I have been fortunate since then and have had some rewards that most persons would consider very much greater than this modest prize of $60 a year. But I tell you that this was the greatest success I ever won. That $60 a year made all the difference in the world to me then. With it, I could continue my education. Without it, I could not have gone on. And uh, that is what is... Uh, said in that statement there. And uh, so he went to Prince of Wales. Uh, Prince of Wales was halfway between a high school and a country college, he writes. In two years, 1870s, 1872, as I work out, I had finished the course there and cast about to earn some money to go on with. The natural thing was to teach, and I secured charge of one of the best schools in the island, for a year, and uh, we've just discovered, uh, uh, Earl uh, and the people at Princeton, that the school that he taught in appears to be in Harrington. I was beginning to think it was probably Summerside, you know, that he taught in Summerside. Harrington is a small place outside of Charlottetown, and uh, there's an obituary of uh, a Chief Justice of Prince Edward Island at the Guardian about 1920, and one of his claims to fame is that he was taught by Jacob Gould Skierman at the Harrington School uh, uh, when he was young. So, you know, this famous man had taught him. So, there, there it is. Of course, you could go through the records of the, uh, in the provincial government and find that as well. Here I taught everything from algebra up to Virgil and... Al uh, sorry. Here I taught everything from the alphabet up to Virgil and algebra and laid by over $100. And years later, he was asked to make a tribute to Dr. Alexander Anderson, uh, Prince of Wales College second president, who was um, at Prince of, was the president from 1868 to 1901, a very long period of time, and taught there even before that, and after that was superintendent of education. He came as a young man from Aberdeen, and what he's written in the, I'll just read a bit of it. Uh, this is Jacob Gould Skierman. The high educational position of Prince Edward Island is a matter of universal recognition among all competent to pronounce an opinion. And this is writing in 1905. What is not perhaps so generally known, though it is equally certain, is that this splendid work has been brought about almost entirely by a single man. If there be today in Prince Edward Island a good school system, good machinery, good teaching, good scholars, it is all due directly or indirectly to his genius for education. Most of the work has been done by himself, the rest has been done by men whom he turned out. Now, be not deceived in this matter, I am as confident of what I am saying as of my own existence. 
Professor Anderson is incomparably the greatest benefactor the island has uh, had within the period of my recollection. I have sat under many instructors, speaking in, um, speaking in different languages, German, English, French, Italian, but I have never yet met such a great teacher as Professor Anderson. I believe there is none to whom all considered I personally owe so much. That's quite a tribute uh, from a, a very you know, important person to his teacher. After his studies at Prince of Wales College, uh, Jacob moved on to Acadia College for two years and led his class in both years. In 1874-75, he took a break and returned to his father's home in Freetown. Uh, during these two years, he led multiple revival services in both Bedeck and Freetown, it is the Baptist uh, revivals, and was living at home when his father died suddenly in 1875 at age 54. In late 1875, he's at Acadia, Jacob wrote the Gilchrist examination in all Canada competition for study in the U United Kingdom, for which he studied so hard that his family thought he might die from overwork and stress. However, his hard work paid off, and he won the $500 scholarship, which covered his costs at the University of London. While there, he got his bachelor's and master's degrees, and soon after, he received his doctorate from Edinburgh University in Mental and Moral Sciences. He then won the Hibbert Travelling Fellowship, enabling him further study in Paris, Italy, Heidelberg, and Gottingen, and he competed for that. He describes in detail, which I, I won't uh, read, uh, his competition for that. Uh, after st uh, studying in Europe, Jacob uh, Skirman returned to Acadia College, this time as a professor of English literature. After two years at Acadia, he moved on. He actually found that it was no longer congenial for him to teach at Acadia. They were largely turning out uh, ministers uh, for the Baptist Church and were very circumscribed uh, uh, in their... Uh, he, he didn't get along. At, uh, he was being circumscribed in his teaching after having been teaching in Europe. It was while uh, he moved on to Dalhousie. Well, it was while working at Dalhousie that his met, met his wife, Boris uh, Barbara Forrest Monroe, the niece of the president of Dalhousie. After four years at Dalhousie, Jacob and his wife moved to the United States, where he began working at Cornell. Uh, he started as professor of philosophy, then became dean of the School of Philosophy, and then in 1892, at the age of 38, the president of Cornell. He had a significant impact on the history of Cornell, which had only been founded in 1868, so if, when he was born, Cornell didn't even exist. Uh, while, he, uh, while he was president, admission to the university quadrupled, and Co Cornell's agriculture, ag medical, veterinary, and forestry colleges were all established. So it was a 30 years at Cornell. It was a sort of um, just founded 1868, and... Um, uh, uh, just starting out, and he largely was responsible for its development in those years. Uh, in 1920, after nearly 30 years as President uh, Gould, as he called himself then, uh, 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 he changed his name to Gould Sherman rather than Jacob Sherman, uh, turned to a diplomatic career. Uh, in his time at Cornell, he had already done diplomatic work in two countries. First, as the president of the first Philippine Commission, I'll come to this in a moment, and later as United States Minister to Greece and Montenegro in 1912-13. But after stepping down from Cornell, he was appointed American ambassador to China and then to Germany from 1925 to 29. And while living in Germany, his wife Barbara died, causing him to start splitting his time between New York and Germany. And eventually he remained in New York permanently, New York State, and held multiple non-elected positions in government. And he died in 1942. Uh, this is a tribute from Ross Graves in the book uh, William Skirman. Lydia Goldrup, Jacob's mother, lived to see her son Jacob Gould attain an international reputation as a scholar, professor, author, university president, philosopher, ambassador, and diplomat, 
her son George, a prominent New York attorney, her sons Major and Maynard, prosperous businessmen in Kensington and Summerside, founding, Maynard founding M.S. Skierman in 1896, her son Caleb, an enterprising wholesale grocer in Chicago, a remarkable family, a remarkable success story, sons who left their widowed mother's farm on the back road through Freetown and rural Prince Edward Island to enter and make their marks in the, ways, uh, in the worlds of education, diplomacy, law, and business. And this, by the way, what, they, were part, they were part of the diaspora of, between 1880, the population of the island fell as many young men and women began to leave uh, by the time, so this is the, the fourth generation from the Loyalists, They're, the land has now been taken up, there's no prospects for uh, future for, for families, so people are leaving, and of course education, it's gone beyond, beyond the pioneer phase, education is becoming a key to success in life and not just hard work. I just want to end by uh, uh, an aspect that I hadn't realized until David Pope uh, brought this to my attention by sending me numerous uh, bits of uh, information on Skirman. And David Pope wrote, uh, um, I can't think of another islander who has made a great, as great a contribution to the world as Jacob Gould Skirman. You'd also be hard pressed to find an individual back in his era who now, in hindsight, was on the right side of every issue, all of which are relevant today. Education for women and minorities, a supporter of women's suffrage, displayed great fairness and foresight in helping the Filipino people become independent, actively opposed Hitler early on, spoke out against anti-Semitism, and between the two great wars, he spoke at events to raise money to help Jewish refugees. He had friends of every nation, color, ethnicity, religion, and social class. And these are, this is the evidence for this. Um, he was a supporter of women's suffrage uh, for the vote for women, and he was not just uh, uh, you know, sitting on the side. Uh, the uh, suffrage, uh, there was a long campaign going back to the 19th century, and it finally was achieved in New York State in 1917. But in 1914 here, uh, women are uh, calling on him, and it says, uh, to obtain an endorsement of equal suffrage from President Jacob Gould Skirman of Cornell. And they got it, too. So he said, I, you know, I back equal suffrage. And uh, he's one of the speakers here. Uh, it's called the Great uh, the Victory Conference 1917, and it's dated... Um, there's a date, August 29th there, but I don't think the victory had been achieved. It's sort of anticipated, and he's one of the speakers listed as speaking at this uh, Votes for Women uh, mass meeting uh, in Saratoga Springs. Uh, you can contrast him with Sir An Andrew McPhail, who, uh, another famous islander, a very talented and very good writer, who was against Votes for Women. Uh, they... Uh, Early black, this is from the Cornell site, uh, and it's uh, <coughs> uh, about early black women at Cornell, and I'm just extracting, uh, black students were welcome at Cornell, but there was a problem about the halls of residence. The white students didn't want them in the halls. And uh, 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 um, Jacob Gould Skierman, uh, had ruled in favor of admitting two African-American students to Sage Hall after 269 white women students had petitioned against them. Skirman declared, University uh, doors must be open to all students, irrespective of race or color or creed. His successor, as it says in the early part of that, there, uh, um, it's the opening part to go back to, President Livingston Ferran, 1920, he was the president, from 1927 to 1937, upheld the color bar at, uh, and wouldn't allow, uh, or at, at least uh, um, the problem was they might say, "Oh, it will cause too much problem." You know, if we, it won't be good for the girls. Uh, whereas Skirman was taking a more principled stance on it, and uh, it was, this was widely reported. This is in 1911 from the New York Times. Uh, Cornell University will not draw the color line. 
a Negro girl's students may have rooms in the Sage College in spite of the objections of the co-eds under a ruling of President uh, Jacob Gould's German. This is the time of, um, you know, they, uh, you're hearing about it now of the um, uh, Jim Crow areas and the, you know, suppression of black people becoming more prominent and uh, he's taken a stand on it. Skirman, uh, just another point, was appointed by President McKinley as president of the first Philippine Commission. You can see how young he is compared to the, in 1899 he's 45, and uh, these are the other members of the commission. The Philippine, uh, America had, uh, the United States had gone to war with Spain, and in the process acquired uh, not only um, Puerto Rico and uh, many other colonies, but the Philippines. And um, uh, this was uh, an issue for a, a young republic who, you know, had fought its own colonial war, that it was now, well, the Philippines did not get their independence until 1948. The, the Americans held on to it as a colony. Uh, but Jacob Gould Skirman was, from the uh, start, uh, in favor of, he would free the Filipinos. He, he began in 1902. In the early days, as head of the commission, he was a bit circumspect uh, about uh, uh, going against the wishes or uh, views of the government. But by 1902, he declared that the Filipinos deserved their independence. And uh, he says, justice, honor, and true Americanism combined with national self-interest and expediency in prescribing that we should permit the Filipinos to govern themselves and to set up within the next few years an independent and sovereign Philippine Republic. Well, that's 1913. It didn't happen until 1948, I think. But, and then he, in 1932, he's, he's, um, uh, he's saying there should be a short period of preparation for independence, but with that allowed, uh, uh, the opinion that the Filipinos could, as a matter of fact, govern themselves better than the Americans could govern them, is, is what he believed. Uh, it didn't happen in his lifetime, so he, he died in 1942, and the Philippines was still an American dependency. Uh, but they did achieve independence in 1948. However, the, uh, uh, last, this, is current, this is last November uh, 2021, a group at uh, Cornell wanted to, uh, is, is head, the Cornell Review, Council Culture Discovers Jacob Gould Skirman. There's a, there's a Skirman or Sherman Hall at uh, Cornell, and the, the students' council uh, um, uh, said that Skirman was head of the commission uh, in 1899, and that, it, uh, uh, he, uh, that the hall should no longer be called Skirman Hall. But the uh, uh, president, uh, of Cornell, the present president said during his presidency of Cornell, uh, at Cornell, uh, President Skirman was reviewed as a champion for increasing the diversity of the student population of Cornell, writing in 1911, all university doors must be remain open to all students, irrespective of color, creed, social standing, or primary condition, a perspective that was rare for the period. Uh, and they, she didn't agree with changing the name of the hall. <laughs> uh, but they hadn't really looked at his whole record. Uh, and then uh, just another uh, area where he was involved uh, is in the um, uh, President Jacob Gould Skirman of Cornell is uh, speaking in, to a, a war fund for Jews during the uh, First World War at the Carnegie Hall in New York. And uh, He's uh, given permission or promoted the building of a synagogue at uh, Cornell for, I'm glad to learn from your letter that the Jewish residents of Ithaca and the Jewish students in Cornell are considering the plans of providing a house of worship in, it in Ithaca and was supportive of that. Um, I'm going to go end with this, uh, back with a picture of uh, Einstein and uh, Skirman and others at the, uh, it was uh, an associate's dinner, and it was in honor of um, uh, Jacob Gould Skirman at the California Institute of Technology. And this is Einstein's speech. It was translated from the German. Um, I don't think he spoke English, or at least 
this has been translated. I greet, uh, and this is welcoming Skirman back from his career as a diplomat, and he's now going to become a um, back to academia of sorts. I greet Professor Skirman in the name of us all. Uh, he is warmly welcome in this circle. He is the traveler who has returned once more to the pursuit of pure knowledge. Your life, Mr. Skierman, has been one of entire correspondence to that ideal role which Plato assigned in his work on the Republic to members of the governing class. You began as a philosopher. After listening in different countries to the masters of your time, you entered into the service of your people, as for, at first as a teacher, and for many years as a leader in the rapidly maturing development of American university methods. You then placed your rich experience with things, countries, and men at the services of the American government to act as diplomat in China and Germany. I had the opportunity of, to observe how salutary was your work in Berlin, with what measure of insight and understanding you knew how to re-establish the presence of that confidence which appeared so hopelessly disturbed no less by the world war than by the conditions of the peace. Thus, in the whole time of your service in Berlin, it was you who was the most loved of the foreign diplomats in that city, you whose fine tact was founded on a knowledge of history and an insight into foreign culture and mentality which is today so rare. Now you are again at home, again in the sense of Plato. After completing your duty to the state to dedicate your entire strength to the contemplative study of things eternal, but not without service to humanity, since you transmit to a younger generation the rich treasure of your experience. We wish happiness for you and for us in this new work. And that is my lecture, and I thank those particular people, and thank you for coming. Thank you. <laughs> any questions? Did he have any children? He had eight children. He had eight children, and uh, uh, they, well, I, I'm not an expert on all aspects of his, his life, but he had eight children, and they're detailed in the Skirman genealogy by Ross Grave, but one became a top um, New York attorney and political person, and uh, he was called Jacob Gould II, Skirman II, I think, uh, using the American fashion, and his grandson, Jacob Gould the Skirman III, endowed a scholarship or, you know, at Cornell in his grandfather's memory. Uh, he, he, he only entered the United States. I mean, his whole um, uh, education and training, and I've left something out, when he, he chose to go to the uh, United Kingdom because he, he said that, uh, and London especially, because he knew, he felt he knew it because through education. He said in Canada we were well steeped in British history. He said I knew nothing of American history at all and uh, so I wanted to see the big city of London and he did see it and enjoy it and then Edinburgh as well. Um, but it wasn't until 18... Uh, Oh dear, what year did he go to the United States? I mean, it was fairly late in life, you know, it wasn't as if he went at the age of 20. Um, uh, he went to Cornell in 1886, so he was, uh, he was 30, 86, minus, uh, he was, uh, uh, yeah, 30, 30, 54, 32. So, uh, uh, you know, he was uh, fairly... Um, he, he spent most of his, his prior uh, education and teaching in Canada or the UK, and two years in Germany, where he learned German, and he had a very um, strong affection for uh, Germany. I've only last week been sent 
um, a thesis uh, uh, on Skirman. Earl Lockerbie has, uh, um, I knew of the thesis, but I couldn't uh, get a copy of it, but Earl managed to get a copy of it. And it goes into a lot of his um, uh, other aspects of his, his life. His, he had one big problem with religion. He, he was raised as a Baptist in the backwoods of Freetown. And he says that, I, when I got to London, I was totally shocked. Uh, I got to university. And I think that led to conflict when he went back to Acadia. He, he kept his Christian faith. He wasn't, um, he, he, but he shifted more um, towards Unitarian, or at least uh, that, he, he had become a philosopher of sorts. Uh, so he had, uh, you know, the enthusiasm of his youth um, uh, had uh, shifted, but he, he kept up his Christian faith. He also uh, developed through his philosophy uh, in, in, in this book, it, it says, uh, an approach to the equality of all people. You know, it was a philosophical approach through his studies that he believed all people were equal and had equal opportunity. And, uh, but he was politically a uh, conservative in terms of uh, and there are a lot of contradictory aspects to his, uh, you know, when you're involved in politics, you're going to do a lot of things you don't <laughs> really uh, perhaps want to at times. But he was never involved directly in politics. It was always um, speaking, you know, in support of campaigning for people. Or, uh, and he kept fairly neutral in, uh, in many respects. Any other questions? But I'm assuming he became an American citizen. He, he became an American citizen in 1892 at the age of 38 when he became president of Cornell. And I don't know if he ever came back on visits to Prince Edward Island or, or not. He certainly came through Canada in 1899 on his way to um, uh, the Philippines. Uh, and, and, well, I mean, Canada is a very short distance from Ithaca in New York, uh, but I, I don't know, uh, I have, uh, you know, there's a, an area of research for someone to, to look at. There's a big archive on him at Cornell, but I have not, David Pope has said he would fund me <laughs> last summer. He said, I'll pay for your way to Cornell if you, uh, I have no, you know, no desire uh, to, uh, I don't have the time, and, or it's not my field of interest, you know, as well go and start on a new study of, uh, 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 but uh, I think he, uh, he's impressed me as a, you know, as a, an outstanding islander uh, for various reasons, not just his achievements, but because of his attitudes. Uh, he had siblings. Yes. And uh, he, uh, you know, he left. Prince of Island, and then did most of his siblings grow up and stay on the island? Well, the, the, um, the, 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 the yes, well, he had eight, he had seven siblings, uh, five brothers and two sisters. The two daughter, the two sisters married and went abroad, and I think they went to the United States. The five boys, uh, three stayed on the island, that's major, Maynard and uh, Robert. Uh, Robert farmed in um, Davis, rather. Davis, Robert is his father. Davis farmed in uh, Freetown, and he had a son, Everett, and then he had a son, Robert, who just died. You know, you probably knew Robert Skirman, uh, and then he, his son presumably has taken over the farm. I, um, uh, so that, the, you know, the Freetown Skirmans uh, descend from. And Maynard Skirman then established uh, M.S. Skirman Company, FM, FM, is it? FM, MF, MF, uh, and uh, Major Skirman also uh, stayed on the island. But the two other brothers, Caleb and George, became, uh, George seems to have been quite an academic as well, and it's possible possible, I'm just speculating, that Jacob Gould sort of uh, mentored him. Uh, he became a London, um, a New York attorney, uh, quite high up, and the other, Caleb, became a, a grocer in Chicago. 
Um, so, but that was normal then, you know, for many uh, people to leave the island and go to the United States. Um, and uh, especially people a achieving a career in academia at that time, I think, or law or whatever. So is he buried in Freetown? No, he's buried in New York. He never, uh, uh, he's not buried in Freetown at all. And I don't know, I suppose you could look at the obituaries in The Guardian in 1942, uh, but I'm sure it, it was written up. He was well known um, as, uh, and the story is in the, um, uh, in the uh, Spearman genealogy by Ross Graves, that in the First World War, um, uh, Harold Skirman, who was the, the present, who was Maynard, who was a nephew, direct nephew of Jacob Gould, was teased at school because his uncle was so prominent in the papers as being, um, I think, not in favor of the war. You know, Canada was at war. But I, in this book, uh, this uh, thesis that I've been reading, uh, he's, he. Um, well, this thesis doesn't cover much it, 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 um, about the Canadian side. I'm not sure. Canada was at war uh, from 1914, uh, whereas the U.S. only entered the war in 1917. So I think Skirman was opposed to the U.S. entering the war, which created a bit of teasing at school um, for his nephew, apparently. Any other... Um, when he retired, didn't he fundraise um, for Heidelberg University? Yes, he, uh, he, uh, uh, he had gone to Heidelberg University uh, during that two years of the Hibbert Scholarship. He became um, uh, a, uh, a very, uh, in the 1925-30 when he was in Germany, he, he, as described by Einstein there, he was uh, very popular. Uh, and he spoke German. He had learned that, he must have learned that in Germany during his Hibbert scholarship, unless he had taken it earlier. Uh, and uh, he raised, uh, while he was ambassador to Germany, he raised uh, a, a fund of half a million American dollars to um, fund, uh, I think, buildings at Heidelberg University. And uh, uh, so, you know, he, he, he maintained that connection. He had been a student there 30 years before, and he it was going through hard times in the 1920s, so he raised money in America uh, to fund this campaign to raise money for, I think it was for buildings, and uh, I'm not sure for what. Do you I think, know? I think it might have been for the new Heidelberg University. They have the yeah. old university. Oh, the yes, new okay. Part of the new yeah. But there was a little interesting, I don't know where I read it, but it was, um, I guess they had erected a, a bust of, of uh, Skirman. Yeah. And in World War II, um, they knocked it, the Nazis knocked it over. Yes. And put Hitler's bust there instead. He, he, he returned to Germany in the 30s when Hitler was on the rise. And uh, he met Hitler on, on, he was a prominent American statesman, he met Hitler on uh, one occasion, I think. I'm, I'm recalling from the thesis, which I've just read, uh, uh, but he refused, he was invited to special Nazi occasions, you know, like at um, uh, rallies or at least, uh, and he, 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 he refused, he, you know, he excused himself, he didn't go to them. And he was well aware of the, um, uh, you know, the, the, he wrote while he was ambassador in the 20s, he was sending all these missives back. But at that time, Hitler wasn't on the rise, you know, it was, Germany was very divided, and uh, he was thought as uh, not in any way going to be a threat to the, the government. Uh, but by the 30s, of course, or late 20s after he left, I don't know if he had been there when Hitler was on the rise, I don't know. As ambassador, I mean, um, it would have been more difficult uh, ambassadorship, probably. Uh, but uh, Hitler's anti-Semitism was certainly known from the start, I think. And of course, Jews were leaving Germany, like Einstein and many others, early on. Was there a 
was there any um, attempt by the PEI government or Canadian government to maybe the Canadian government to try to bring him back into Canada or to seek no. his advice? Not that I'm aware of. Um, um, I think he had become, uh, when he became an American citizen, he sort of thenceforward viewed himself. And as you saw, although his Canadian roots were recognized, he was being taken as an American, an exemplum for American youth, you know, the poor boy who's, who's, done, who's made good. And uh, uh, so he had, uh, which is interesting, he never forgot his island roots, or, and he appreciated his background and his education, as you saw in the tribute to Professor Anderson. Uh, but he, I think, uh, uh, he never looked back, you know, once he got to the United States. And the position at Cornell, I was looking at Cornell uh, on the internet, and it's not a, uh, that large a university today. I mean, it, my University of Ulster in Northern Ireland is uh, twice the size of Cornell, you know, 40,000 students, where Cornell seemed to have about 20,000. I don't know what it is. But that may be, it's, you know, it goes for quality rather than quantity. But Cornell, of course, is one of the top universities in the United States and uh, has also developed a lot of in the more applied lines, agriculture, forestry, and fields like that, which happened during his time. Any other questions? We had brief, uh, brief 